Paddington, you are the world's worst carriage driver. Oh, do you care to take the reins? Why not? Out of the toilet! Don't do this! Don't do this! Please stand down! Out! Out! Don't do this! Get out of the fucking toilet! No! very pleased to have uh, this chat with you today. Uh, Ruth, you are um, a great, great uh, composer. Your score, your scores includes uh, for feature City of Tiny Lights, Legacy, directed by Pete Travis, uh, 28K from Paul Habits, uh, and for television, I think everybody remembers uh, Jed Mercurio's uh, Critical, Bodyguard, uh, but you've also uh, did periodic drama like Victoria, Ruthering Heights, and more contemporary uh, Love Nina with Elena Badam Carter. And I believe you started uh, in the commercials. So what was the bridge? Um, how did you came to uh, compose for feature and television? And uh, what was the, the little the, the little plus of working for commercials before? So I got into doing commercials because uh, a boyfriend I had at college knew someone who ran a music house that did music for commercials. So I got myself a job there despite not having any equipment at all. I think I had a Clavinova, which I could record uh, 12 tracks, uh, no other equipment. So I did some demos on that. I also had some music that I'd written for plays whilst I was at college. So I took that on a cassette to the guys there and they actually quite liked the music. So they gave me a chance to do some work for their commercials, which was really good. I mean, I, I got a loan, I bought some equipment, I set myself up a little studio and then I started to do these short form commercials, um, mainly kind of children's TV ads. I did a lot of things like that, but it was a really good discipline actually. It gets you to kind of know how to work under pressure and it gets you to experience a lot of different styles of music so i guess i learned those kind of skills and how to how to work to a deadline but i think i found that short form was frustrating and i was basically working for plays i felt like i could really connect with the narrative and that's what i really that's what really inspired me to write music was a story and although each advert's a mini story in itself i was longing to do something of feature length. So that's what I just aimed for. And I, it was a long journey actually to get to that point because uh, I didn't really know anyone in the industry. So I got a job at a TV studio, ITV, just working in the sound department. And I learned about the industry and I used to hang out <laughs> and hang out by the edit suites and literally give them music that I'd written and asked mm. to, to get a gig. And that's how I got my first gigs writing for documentaries. Um, and then I met a composer, Martin Phipps, further down the line, uh, and he did music for drama and his music just blew me away. And I went to a session that he'd done for, I think it was North and South, which is this fantastic BBC period drama. I heard the orchestra playing and I saw the images that the music was going to, and I was just transfixed. I thought, right, okay, drama, this is what I want to do. I want to work with not just orchestras, but of this work on this level, this scale. So I just hassled him to give me a job, basically. So he um, he had uh, had a job, had a, a drama he was working on. He was a bit pushed for time. So he said, do you want to do a couple of scenes? Mm -hmm. So I wrote some scenes and this is having heard some of my music, which he really liked. So that was I had a, a demo that of, of theatre music that I'd done and I think it was that music rather than the music for commercials that grabbed his attention because it was more about my own personality and my style that was in the music that he could hear. Um, so I wrote some stuff, it went well. We did, we recorded it with an orchestra and it was just the biggest buzz. Um, I just thought, right, this is it. This is what I wanna do. And through working with him, I learned 
how I should, how to do it because I'd be in the back of the room whilst he was in a meeting with directors and then he was being like whipped <laughs> or, or congratulated or whatever happens you know whatever happens in those meetings it's um it's quite a fiery place maybe and um that's how I sort of figured out it's all about it's not just the music you do it's about how you manage people and situations mm -hmm. and how you can sell your music to an audience who may not like it at first but if you really believe in your idea then you can you learn ways of persuading them that it's a good idea um and then so that was such a good apprenticeship like working with him and then quite quickly within a couple of years he'd um had a drama he didn't he, he didn't really fancy doing or he hadn't got time to to do and put, suggested me um and because of his reputation they said oh yeah okay we'll give her a go and then once i'd done that first drama then that opened the door to more and that director went on to do a bbc series which was true day kiss that was my first big series which was about 13 years ago now um and that really got me going you know once i had that series then you know there was more chances of getting work with others and it went from there and it's really been led by the people that i've worked with so the producer of true dare kiss marcus wilson went on to whitechapel introduced me to sj clarkson sj and i hit it off you know she's pretty hard task mistress um a very formidable and fantastic director um took me on to do work with her on four of her other projects so that was really great and so every single job I've met somebody who's taken me to the next stage and I guess that's also why when we talked about the variety that I've done it's to do with the personalities of the people that I've you feel drawn and you connect with people and then they work on different things so when I got when I did uh, critical with so I'd, I'd done Whitechapel with John East, another amazing, fantastic director and lovely man as well. And uh, he said, I've got this critic, I've got this show called Critical. It's a it's a medical show by Jed McCurio. And I went, Oh my god, Jed McCurio. I just love his writing. He's amazing. Um, yeah, sounds brilliant. And that was a very sort of high octane, 13 parts in real time. And the score ended up being seven minute cues just basically ratcheting up the tension and tension because it was um basically real time in a in a trauma ward so you'd have an hour an hour's real time of an actual operation taking place um i did that job the producer of critical chris hall then he did a, the durrells which is a very beautiful greek family drama set in corfu with kini hawes and the music that i composed for that was completely different and very well Greek and sunny and smaller band of musicians and you know just a different style so I think it's it's the people it's the personalities that that kind of draw you into different spheres you know so you as you say you have a very uh, you're eclectic you have a great variety and I and and i understand uh, that it comes from the director but i believe you also have your sound you have your style so how does it work where how do you make sure you have room uh for your voice your sound um and living room and hearing what's the style and the desire of the director that's so true because some directors that we've mentioned like pete travis and sj clarkson have very strong ideas and vision about what they want to do. Um, SJ particular has a very strong musical vision. So she may come along with a, a temp score that she particularly really loves. And the challenge for me is to find an original theme that still works within her vision, but that has its own individuality. And that is me because ultimately no one wants to hear you copy a temp score. You know, that's just going to be rubbish you know they may as well just license that if they can it's just going to be music by numbers rather than something that is totally unique to the to the drama so sometimes with those directors it can seem 
like a high wall to climb because it feels, especially if it's a great score that you're, you know, they've found some amazing piece of temp and you think, oh, I'm never going to do any better than that. But it's always like you go with your, with your heart and your gut. And um, for me, it's like when I first see the assemblies that come through, there'd be a particular scene that just jumps out at me. And I just, I forget the fear and I just kind of connect with something in the scene and I just start playing something. And it's usually, it's literally like my 20 minute wonder phase where I just get a flash of inspiration, just kind of comes. I mean, I remember when I, the first uh, thing I saw of the Durrells, I just sat down quickly and put a little sketch together. And that ended up being one of the main themes in the show. Do you, do you first, uh, it, it raises a question, maybe uh, lots of people ask you, uh, when do you hear the music? Where do you like to start? Is it by reading the script? Yeah, I always read the script. I mean, I don't really get any music going on whilst I'm reading the script, but I get a sense of what the story is about, like whose perspective it is, what is where is it coming from? What's this angle? What's at the heart of the script? And that's often what you talk about in the meeting isn't just like what style of music you're going to do, but what is the story really about? And then you can, like with Bodyguard, it's it's about David, Richard Madden's characters, his PTSD, his internal conflict, and then this relationship he has with the woman he protects. He also can't stand her, but he also wants to shag her as well. You know, so for me, it was like finding a... <laughs> a sound that kind of got both the tension and the fear, but also the kind of mischief of it. So it was like, okay, Tom, I didn't really want a big tune. He just said, I just want, just do some sound, like sort of almost like sound design or something. So it's like, yeah, but I want it to kind of have this beat or this throb because it's kind of like the beat of a club that's pulling you back in at the end of a night. You know, you shouldn't go back, but you want to go back. So, so it's that, that kind, kind of, of boom, boom, boom. That, that was the, the kind, kind of starting point was that sound. And, and I, I just wanted to make, make it fun. fun. Like it is quite fun. It's intoxicating. And, and then building these, these is, it was all about, about, I just thought, how can I make, make this, this train scene that we saw earlier? Like, like how can I make, make it sound, feel even more tense than it is already? And then I just had this idea of a brass, a bass trombone, but just playing a note really, really slowly, slowly and just going, going up really, really slowly until he, he was actually circular breathing whilst he did it. <laughs> so he kept on yeah. playing a note, but just keeping on going up really, really slowly. And then I stretched it and stretched it till it became almost like six minutes. So you just get this unbearable feeling of tension, almost like a noose around your neck or something. So I think my style is like, finding an instrument or a sound that kind of goes into the heart of the show somehow. Uh, so talking about sound design, when you explain that work you did on the Bodyguard, it raises a question uh, on the importance of sound design and where do you think that music stops and sound design starts? Yeah, with that one, I sort of, that was a really good example of it because the music that I created we used a lot of sounds as I just told you with the the trombone and scratchy the scratchy electric cello and a lot of um modular synths that my husband Ruskin who's also part of my company did and created uh which almost sound like it's it sounds it's almost like it affects your reptilian brain or something. It kind of gives you that kind of fight or flight response when you hear it. And it could be akin to like wheels being ripped off the train. And, you know, it, it kind of goes in with those sounds because it is, it is a kind of in that sound design world, I suppose. Do you think, do you think that uh, a good score can be listened without the images standing alone or I definitely think that scores can be listened to without the images. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so many of my favorite composers like Morricone and Thomas Newman, and they, I listen to those scores without, without the images. I even, I mean, I played the music from Jaws to my kids and they're absolutely terrified, you know, turn the lights off, play that music. 
it's it has a complete visceral reaction that's amazing yeah well, i think definitely standalone i wanted to ask you you mentioned a few of them what was your podium who are your great influencers and what what's your podium or what's the maybe the the, the film you would have liked to make the music of Uh, you know, one of the, I really loved Flash Gordon as a kid. I loved the throbbing beat in that. That was a real inspiration. Do you remember that film? It's a real kitsch film from the 80s. Oh, it's just amazing tunes. And he creates the sound that is so unique as well, you know. Like people had never heard sounds like that before they made spaghetti westerns. Now you just associate that sound with a western. But before then, what was that sound? You know, he's just made the sound of a desert and in kind of, got it in people's heads that's just that's would be something to be to aspire to definitely it would be brilliant so is there a universe you would like to to put uh, to put sound to the sea the the the, the, the outer space space films are quite quite cool aren't they i mean the um scores to i'm trying to think uh there was a really good score recently um that Hans Zimmer did for outer space mm -hmm. universe what I like to do I don't know maybe underwater that would be good so you were you were mentioning that you you got influence from uh, those film in the 70s 80s uh, so these are your great uh, influencers I guess it's the stuff I grew up with as a kid you know that's what um Yeah, all the John Williams films. And I think the John Carpenter scores I really like, you know, mm. Halloween, things like that. That was a bit of an influence. I've just done a, a score for a ITV show called The Sister recently. And that had a, a bit of a John Carpenter influence in it because it's got a ghost in it. So something to watch out for. But for me, it's like working with the, working with the musicians is really inspiring to me you know um and working like i'm just doing a job at the moment called bloodlands which is uh jeb mercurio's new new project and um it's it's set in northern ireland and it kind of reflects back on the troubles um the ira and things like that and um it was great sort of starting early on so when we talked earlier about how do you get into the project and how do you connect with these directors and do your own sound and i think the main thing is um starting early and working with those early assemblies and i for me it was reading the script watching those watching some assemblies and then actually putting them to one side and then going to belfast where they were filming and hooking up with some musicians there so it was like a guitarist fiddle pipes and drums even though they said absolutely do not do Irish music, just anything else, but not Irish music because it's set in Ireland. So they didn't want it to be a kind of fiddle dee, -dee kind of music. Um, but I really wanted those instruments to be part of the sound somehow. So I had some sketches that just from reading the script and getting some ideas, I just had these ideas and then worked with the musicians and made, made some pieces, came back, recorded some drums and cello and things sent them to the edit and they really liked them, put them in and that became the main theme. So a lot of the job was then cracked because they'd laid up the theme that I'd done right at the end of episode one and it, it was just, it worked a treat. So a lot of the problems of getting around the temp score was solved by just having gone out there and come up with some music, which was completely like original because we hadn't even discussed any temp scores or references, but we were on the same page in that he'd said, you know, Rai Kuda, think about Western music. And Rai Kuda's another fantastic composer who I really, really like. So we were kind of making the sounds of the Mourns, this landscape in Ireland, it's like, it's almost like the desert in a way. And the feeling of terrorism, like the IRA, it's real. They, that feeling that it, it's not like trying to score a born identity or, or an American thriller. It's got to feel like, in, even like in, in Bodyguard, the threat is real. So somehow in the music, you give it that feeling 
of tension, but in a kind of understated way, rather than using big action strings or anything too cliched. It's like the sound of the landscape, which is something that I, I guess I discovered when I was doing Wuthering Heights, that one of my early jobs was kind of like finding what the sound of the moors was. And that was a really exciting job to work on because the director, Koki, Kuchoris, she, um, she really didn't want a traditional orchestral score for that period drama. She wanted um, something a bit like, uh, a bit sort of Nick Cave type of feeling. This is 10 years ago before he became very popular in a lot of uh, tent scores. <laughs> but um, we used some really big drums like Tom's and for Heathcliff's character and really sort of folk scratchy violin for um, Kathy. And yeah, I loved that really got me into thinking outside of the box. You know, you can really th experiment and throw different sounds onto the film that you're doing that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find there. And I think that's what the, the joy of it is. You talk about it very, very well. When you talk about the way you 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 you, you put sound to uh, to Ireland, you talk about it very very well. I heard you just a little bit earlier talk about uh, the sound of Greece. Yes, um, maybe we That's could right. listen to that clip from Sanditon. Oh yes, so, so Sanditon was a Jane Austen series uh, last year came out on ITV. And again, the director, I think I <laughs> seem to be gravitate to these people who who want to push things, you know, they want to do things differently. And uh, so it's Jane. So it's um, Sanditon, which was Jane Austen's last novel, the unfinished novel. And it's set in a seaside town, but they wanted it to feel like almost like uh, American pioneers or something like people going to start this. He, this guy is a little bit of a crazy character he wants to start a seaside resort in this place and they wanted to give it a kind of like a deadwood slight western quality to it and the really interesting part of the job was that I came in early again and Ollie wanted me to find the musicians to be on the set because there's a big ballroom scene in the show in the episode first episode and it's regency period so there's a lot of <laughs> tall guys you know so they've got to look kind of good look the part as well as well as being able to play and we wanted to make it folk because folk was really big in those times but we also wanted it to give it a bit of a kind of sexy rock and roll feel not real rock and roll but just kind of up the tempos a bit and so he sent me off to find these musicians and I went off to Scotland and found that literally put this Celtic super group together and uh, of astonishing players and they looked really good as well <laughs> I was very lucky um that they all came down play the music on set it was quiet I mean they played these we found particular uh, folk standards of the day but the way they played them was just really like totally rocking you know and it, I think at the time when it when it went out Twitter just exploded because people didn't believe that at that time that they would hear music like that. We even had a Gaelic singer who kept, who sang a song which was amazing, um, very fast, puetabuel, almost like rapping. <laughs> but it was it was totally around at the time. But people didn't believe that it was. Some people didn't believe that it was real, and they got very offended by you know doing a period drama and then seeming to put music that didn't fit. From the period but it was totally authentic so we had to um put a lot of information out <laughs> to show that we had really done our research and um uh to create this sound but the best thing about working with the, these players early and making that Bora music was that i got to know them and their in, like mind-blowing virtuosity of their instruments and realized that it would be, and talking to Ollie, the director, like, let's do the score with these guys, you know, like let's record all the music so that the ballroom music and the score and everything has got this homogenous sound to it. 
So that's what we did. I had a theme again very early on in the edit. It's like, you know, give me some music. We need to sell it to the Belinda, the exec. We need to show her that we're um because especially when you're trying to do something a bit risky that might be perceived to be modern or against the period, you've got to be pretty sure of what you're doing and everybody needs to be on board, you know, otherwise you know, somebody's head's going to be on the block. So um, I wrote the themes, went up to Glasgow, recorded it with them. They were people who've never really recorded uh, on scores before, but it made the whole process really exciting because it makes, it pushes you out of your comfort zone, which is always really, really good. I think as an artist to be pushed out of your comfort zone, because then it forces you to explore things you've never done before. And because they were so nice as well, it, it, they all contributed and improvised ideas into the music that I was writing. And it was just sort of taking shape, you know, and the soundtrack, uh, has become so popular by the, the people who've watched the show, they've kind of really love it because, and I think that's sort of down to the, it's almost like you can, you can hear the personalities of the people who are, who are playing in it and it. And it's again, it's sort of capturing the sound of a place and a feeling of the time. It's like, okay, it's a period drama. So you would expect like with Victoria, you expect that kind of grand orchestral sound or piano, soothing piano music, or, you know, classical basically. And with Sanditon, I did something which was a bit more, uh, has a bit more of a beat to it and it has a bit more of a rough edge to it. But um, in the clip that I was going to show, um, this bit is quite beautiful, but it has, you can hear the, the folk violin in it. You can hear the drums, you can hear the guitars. So it's, that's basically my, my Celtic super group with my amazing cellist from London in there as well. So we can have a look at that. You mentioned, you just said something, you said that um, people, uh, you were attracted to people who pushing you to, to the extreme, something like that you just mentioned. Uh, and it made me thought that maybe it's because you inspire these people. Oh, that's a really good, so well, that would give that's... me joy. You know, they keep coming back for more, you know, <laughs> these people that I mentioned, SJ, five projects, Pete, five projects, Jed, me, three projects, you know, Ollie too, so they, think, they uh... also come back. <laughs> yes, I think you inspired them. Some torment in the relationships, it can get heated, you know, it can, I think with, with creative people, it can, you know, that they're either can explode or they could even cry or something. I mean, I, I, I brought people to tears sometimes with the music, mm -hmm. which is, which is really, and I've been brought to tears, not by my music, but by what somebody said about it. You know, it can be crushing sometimes when, um, you know, you've produced a piece of music and then they don't like it and they not only don't like it, but they, they say something quite rude about it and then you feel crushed. But I think a big part of the job is learning how to deal with that criticism. And if you believe in it, then you turn around and go, well, I don't hear what you're saying. Like, can we play this again? Can you hear it again? Because often hearing it the second time, they then, especially if they've been used to their, their attempt score, they have something in their head and then it's, they, they sort of react and go, oh, it's not that anymore. They don't like it. And then you listen again and you go, actually, that's a bit better than I thought. Now, can we think about it a bit? And then there might be something like a sound in there that they not, they don't, I don't like the recorder. Okay, right kill the recorder that or that high whistly sound in there so you go in and you mute that bit okay i don't really like this brrr sound at the bottom okay mute that and eventually after muting a few things oh i like it you know so actually you've saved your piece you didn't go oh it was shit i'm rubbish you know which honestly i felt like that at times like oh no and then if you show like, oh, I'm upset by something, they go, oh no, you're amazing. They don't realize that you're a fragile, creative person as well. 
you know. So that's, it's, that's interesting because it's true that uh, either you're a director, a producer, a writer, a, a musician, it's, uh, you, you always have to sell. You create and you sell. And the combination of uh, both can be sometimes quite uh, excruciating. You mentioned earlier yeah. that uh, Martin, Martin Phipps was your mentor. Yes, um, definitely. And yeah. I wanted to, to point to you something that I discovered uh, uh, just recently. Only 6% in, uh, in 2019, only 6% of the music wrote for feature was uh, written by, uh, by women. Um, only twice did a woman had an Oscar, uh, once in 1997 for Emma, Rachel Portman, and uh, one in 1998 for the full Monty and Dudley. Never ever. And Hilda for um, the Joker, recently. And you're right, and oh, Hilda, so one. three times. She's you were in 2017. You four were, uh, I'm sorry? I said four, you know, when I get, I'll be next. <laughs> exactly. Because in 2017, we were nominated for an Emmy for Victoria. Um, yeah. And all this to say that, um, do, do, do you think, do you realize that you're certainly a great inspiration? Uh, not only for women, for men too, but a great inspiration and you also mentioned a little bit earlier that you worked with, uh, you liked sharing with musicians. So how do you see uh, that you can be a mentor in your turn, as Martin Phipps yeah. was for you? Yes, I just, I yeah, I would love to. Um, that you know, I, I think it, it'd be amazing to inspire other other people, uh, women too. You know, growing up and knowing what I wanted to do sort of from a fairly early age, I suppose, when I was leaving around when I was at college, I, I figured that that's, this is what I'd like to do. And then kind of landing that job at around sort of 30 years old. Um, I never thought I couldn't do it, but it was slightly disquieting to, to see that there weren't that many women doing it. But I didn't let that stop me from doing it. I could see Rachel Portman uh, did incredible music and I loved her music, but I also knew that she had a family. That gave me hope that, you know, you could juggle the two. You don't have to give up this, the idea of possibly having a family too. And I have got two girls, five and 10, and I'm managing to juggle it. But it is really hard because obviously when the deadlines come, you've got to work through the night and I do, but I've got a really, cool supportive husband who's there you know picking up the pieces afterwards um uh but i think sometimes i mean look it's it's been a guy's game hasn't it for for centuries music has been a traditionally male orientated world and so is the studio land as well you know the technical side is very male dominated but there's no reason why women shouldn't feel that they, they can do it i mean i think it possibly could be a an issue of confidence in some cases but yeah I mean if I can inspire others to think that it's possible I'm a normal human being you know I've I hadn't I didn't get a job straight away I've worked through done loads of different things to get to where I've got to a lot of a, a lot of hard work and and also learning from the right people as well so yeah I mean I I always work with the same musicians like we were talking about before. So I bring my team on. Uh, I have a fantastic orchestrator that I work with. I have other writers that I work with uh, that help me. So I hope that maybe I've helped them too, you know, and just by doing what I'm doing, if that inspires people, then that's, that's fantastic. You know, that's what you, what I would want. Well, we were very, very uh, honored to have you Ruth, uh, part of the city cities. Uh, uh, to hear about your thoughts. We could have uh, gone on a lot longer uh, and we will certainly uh, be listening to uh, some of your uh, pieces after uh, listening to this talk. Thank you so much and uh, hope to see you soon in Series Series for real. Yeah.